Hello there, uh, Wilfred Riley. How you doing? Doing well. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Glenn Lowry here at the Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv. I'm professor of economics and the social sciences at Brown University. Uh, and I'm speaking with Wilfred Riley, who's associate professor of political science at Kentucky State University. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the Glenn Show, Will. Oh, Glenn, I'm glad to be on. Been a fan of your work for a while, in fact. Have you? Okay, well, uh, we will want to hear more about that. Let me just uh, say for the record that uh, the Glenn Show is sponsored by the Watson Institute for International and, a Public, International and Public Affairs here at Brown, <clears throat> a very fine institution with which I'm associated. All right, so we've got Wilfred Riley here. Uh, he is the author um, of a new book. The book is called Hoax, How the Mass Media Misreports Hate Crimes and Sells a Fake Race War to the American People. Uh, that's a provocative title, especially in the aftermath of the Jesse Smollett uh, case that played itself out in Chicago not long ago that everybody in the world has heard about. Um, I'm just curious of how it is that you came to um, came to take this issue up uh, with the uh, benefit of your scholarly expertise and so on. All right. Um, yeah, the book is uh, Hate Crime Hoax, subtitle, as you've described. And the... Uh the way that I became interested in the phenomenon of hoax hate crimes was actually fairly personal. So I am, as, as I hear you are, from Chicago. I am from Chicago, south side of Chicago, Park Manor, 73rd and Michigan Avenue near the Dan Ryan Expressway. Graduated high school in 1965. 1965, oh. Will. <laughs> All right. yeah, I'm from Chicago. It was a different Chicago than the one that you're from, but I'm from Chicago. <laughs> Still the, same, still the same city in a lot of ways. I was born on the north side near Ashland and Division, lived on the south side, Bridgeport. I have family down there in Inglewood. I graduated, I actually, for athletic and academic reasons, went about 20 miles outside the city for high school. So I graduated from East Aurora Senior in the second largest city in the state. But yeah, Chicago. And, um, and that's very relevant to my interest in hoax hate crimes, because as you may recall, in 2012, a uh, Velvet Rope Ultra Lounge, which was one of kind of the well-known sort of hipster bar venues in the city, very gay friendly. A lot of graduate students went there, burnt to the ground. I had probably 15 friends that used to go there and dance. And the there were, you know, terrible anti-gay epithets written throughout the building. It was very obvious that an accelerant, a gasoline or something like that had been used to set the building ablaze. So the Tribune focused very heavily on this story, as you can imagine, for uh, days at first and then updates on the case for a period of weeks. And I obviously followed this story closely. And in this period from, say, 2012 to 2014, I became aware of a number of other cases like this in very specifically the upper Midwest. So at the University of Chicago, uh, it's our most prestigious educational institution, although Northwestern folks might quibble. Um, there was a claim that a campus activist had had his Facebook page hacked, and he had been threatened by a group of conservatives who he called the U Chicago Electronic Army. He presented this as a mass movement with rape, uh, on one occasion, I believe, with death. This guy's name was Derek Cockaline, another front page Tribune story. Uh, at Grand Valley State, just up the road, uh, in, as you move into Michigan, there was the claim that on the first day of Black History Month, a young woman had had the whiteboard that college kids have in their rooms defaced, uh, I would assume, after a break-in. Someone had written, go home, you black bee, um, bleep Black History Month, Martin Luther King was an N-word, all this uh, offensive stuff. The most ridiculous case was uh, took place at Michigan Tech, where a student named Matt Schultz was initially arrested on terrorism charges following the claim that he had threatened to shoot every black student on campus. So a lot of books have sort of a made-up backstory. This has a real backstory. I was a graduate student. I was involved in the community when these high-profile front-page hate crime stories involving students in the area were taking place, and I followed them. And it turned out that all of them were fakes. Um, in the Velvet Rope case, this became regional, if not national, news it turned out that the owner, a guy named Frank Elliott, just owed a bunch of people money. Not always the best idea in Chicago. So he burnt his own business to the ground and apparently wrote the epithets himself. All this came out not as the result of investigative reporting or even police work, 
but as the result of an insurance audit into the business when they were deciding how much to compensate him. Um, it turned out that he had been tens of thousands of dollars in debt. A friend of his who had been rounded up on a felony drug and driving charge turned state's evidence, detailed a lot of what had gone on there. As I recall, he went to prison briefly. But by the time all this happened, Mr. Elliott had already held a major fundraiser at another trendy bar in Chicago and raised enough money to open a third trendy bar in Chicago called Bonsai, which as I understand is still there, still in the city. So that's what happened with that case. And all of the rest collapsed. I mean, without rambling on, Derek Cockaline sent the no, no, I, I think I didn't want to interrupt you, uh, but I think I've got the picture. You were affected by discovering that a number of incidents that had been reported, uh, I assume with some fanfare in the press, uh, as uh, violations of people of color of African Americans as hate crimes uh, turned out to be untrue. And that, that sent you on, your, on, on the path that has resulted in this book. Um, and I want to hear more about the extent, because these are anecdotes that you've told. I assume that you've had an effort, you've made an effort to do a systematic assessment of the extent of this thing. But the main question that I want to ask you, and I know a lot of people will be thinking this is, okay, okay, you can name a number of instances in which people have, uh, have uh, faked, like uh, Jesse Smollett did, uh, stuff happening to them. That doesn't mean that there's not hate. Or that there aren't hate crimes. And it would appear that you want us to somehow reduce our vigilance about this problem. I don't want to put words in your mouth and I don't want to impute motives to you. But I'm saying if indeed uh, we're talking about mass media misreporting hate crimes and selling a fake race war, you want to reorient our concerns about the uh, the things that actually endanger uh, African-Americans or Jews or uh, 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 Muslims or other groups that might be the subject of this hate crime. And, and, and why should we ratchet down our alertness, back off a little bit from our concern about these matters, just because there exist a few instance, instances like the one of Jesse Smollett uh, that turned out to be phony? Well, Dr. Lowry, Glenn, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a few incidents. I mean, to some extent, I think obviously both of us are against real hate. Both of us are against real racism. You, to some extent, I don't know. It, 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 at any rate, it's not a few incidents. Uh, putting together the book, I used basic tools of scholastic analysis from analyzing Google in depth to going to pre-existing websites to compiling data in Stata to put together what I want to eventually be a master list of these hate crime hoaxes. At the time that I published the book Hate Crime Hoax, I had 409 hoax hate incidents. Uh, that's currently up to 618. Uh, I believe I sent this uh, data set over to you. You did, fact. and I took a look at it, and it, it's extensive, no doubt about it. Yeah, I, I think it's fairly well done. Obviously, there's always room for vetting with a data set like that. But, I mean, you have to understand in context, and I think you do, that there are only about 7,000 reported actual hate crimes, felony or A misdemeanor, B misdemeanor, bias attacks in a typical year. Um, of those, about 8 to 10%, and that's the estimate of myself, a research associate, and a police contact, 8 to 10%, are widely reported enough to even attract the attention of an ethical national researcher. So you've got, taking a high-end estimate, 700 serious nationally reported hate crimes in a year that could turn out to be hoaxes. My data set is based over a period of about five years. I mean, there are cases like Tawana Brawley that predate there are a few 2019 cases on the list, as you saw. But let's say I have 500 cases within a five-year period where you could have a max of 700 national cases in a year. You're talking about a proven false report or hoax rate of roughly 15%, which is remarkable. I will say there's a flip side to that, by the way. The other 85% of the cases do not end at a criminal prosecution and a conviction. The conviction rate, and I need to do more vetting on this, we're both academics, but the conviction rate in hate crime cases seems to be about 6%. Uh, looking at the data from those states where that is available, California, Iowa, what you find, taking California 2016 data, being as specific as possible, in that year there were 931 claimed felony or a misdemeanor hate assaults, hate attacks. Of those, only 220 were even referred to the prosecutor which is a very basic standard, meaning we have any kind of suspect, and this case isn't a hoax. There were, if I recall correctly, as always, this show and elsewhere, I welcome clarification, there were 51 convictions. So out of a 1,000 cases, roughly, you had 50 to 60 convictions. Uh, that's pretty typical. 
So, I mean, if you apply those numbers to 3,500 cases over five years, if you say 500 hoaxes, you would assume between, say, 175 and 350 actual convictions. So the rate to which hate crimes turn out to be hoaxes or to be false is extremely high. The conviction rate is extremely low. Okay, hold hold on. I want to make sure I got these numbers right. Uh, Taking the uh, uh, universe of uh, reported hate crimes, where does that come from? The FBI? Yeah, that's FBI data. Hold on, hold on. Taking the universe and then cutting it down because you want to look only at those that would have gotten some national attention that would have been high profile enough. So that's going to be a certain percentage of those. And then comparing that to the number of hoaxes that you can document, you've, you've uh, done that over a period of years, but you're going to kind of prorate those over an annual basis to come up with a number like between 10 and 15 percent of the significantly reported hate crimes are hoaxes. Did I get that correct? Because I just want to get the facts here. Is yeah. that accurate? That's a good quick synopsis. Yeah, a a little under 15 percent of nationally reported hate crimes in the study period turned out to be hoaxes. Okay, proven. Uh, Now, in addition to that, you want to then look at the conviction rate of crimes that actually get into court. And you're saying that it's lower than one would expect it to be if the factual basis for the claim of having been the victim of hate crime were not uh, were not false. Again, I want you to clarify that. What, how are you using the information about conviction rates? Essentially, as a, you're using that as a comparison metric or a null hypothesis metric relative to the rate of hoaxes. What I, all I'm saying here, obviously not all hate crimes are hoaxes. I don't think anyone... Well, I think we got, we got the bodies in the morgue to make, uh, make that point. Yes. yes, unfortunately, there are very real mass shootings. I do want to emphasize, I think there's a tendency on both the left and the right to take words out of context in the political debate and so on. Obviously, I'm not a supporter of hate crime. I don't even know. I think there are real hate crimes. We need to punish real hate criminals. What I'm saying here is that this is an area where you appear to have a roughly 15% complete hoax, falsification rate, at least among prominent cases, and where you appear to have a, let's say, less than 10% conviction rate. So the argument that there is an unchallenged epidemic of hate crimes, these are not fakes, these result in a conviction, these result in a death, that is not accurate. And I think that's one of the major points of the book. This ties into, by the way, and I think we'll get more into this, but a larger question about how accurate this narrative of massive ethnic conflict is. So when you look... Hold on, I don't want you to go on to another point just yet. Thank you. I I mean, I definitely want to hear about, about the general question about the narrative, but I'm still trying to parse the uh, issue of the quantity the, uh, and how much of it is, uh, is uh, invalid and what we should make of that. Because okay. with respect, I'm not sure you answered my question. And my question was, allowing for the possibility that a certain number of these reports are fake, should that change our general disposition toward the issue of, uh, uh, you know, racially or religiously motivated uh, criminal victimization? Because people are definitely on the alert. I mean, there is talk about an epidemic of hate crimes. Evidently, you think that's false. You think there's an epidemic of hoaxes, not an epidemic of hate crimes. But, um, you know, uh, that church in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, everybody remembers what happened when uh, the gunman went in there, Dylan Root, if I remember the man's name correctly, and shot up that church. Um, and uh, so on. Okay, Ch- churches are getting burned, right? I mean, that's really happening some places sometimes. Um, there's, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, threat of domestic terrorism motivated by right wing, uh, white nationalists, whatever would appear to be a real threat. Isn't it? Should we be thinking differently about these threats in virtue of your research? How do you want the narrative to go this kind of I think that's a purely mathematical question, Glenn. I mean, yes, obviously, to some extent, if out of a category of cases that are normally all treated as though they were real and resulted in criminal prosecutions, 90 percent did not result in criminal prosecutions or convictions and 20 percent, 15 percent, let's say, turn out to be false. Yes, that should change our estimate of how much epidemic danger there is out there. Many or most, by the way, this among the most high profile cases, by the way, I have not yet calculated this using modern empirical methods, but the false reporting rate must be much higher. If you look at Jussie Smollett, 
Covington Catholic, Yasmin Saweed, Key in College, Eastern Michigan, the young black woman in Grand Rapids that claimed she was literally urinated on, uh, many of the cases that have produced street marches, Air Force Academy, where a general came to the campus to speak against racism, the burning of Hopewell Baptist, the most famous of the churches you just cited. Every one of those cases is a proven hoax and most appear in the book. So, yes, if you going through the first 10 pages of Google, standard empirical analysis, how many mainstream media stories about each case took place, if out of the 10 highest profile hate cases in the country, which provoked major marches, seven turn out to be fakes, Yes, that should empirically affect our analysis of how much of a threat hate crimes are. That doesn't mean that when a hate crime incident takes place, it shouldn't be investigated, an alleged hate crime incident. That doesn't mean that if the incident turns out to be a fake, we shouldn't imprison or fry the guy involved. But it does mean, and this is true of a lot of areas of intense media focus, by the way, like young child kidnapping. It does mean that if we look at the real numbers and there's not much of a threat, we should tone down the panic. Uh, Barry Glasner in The Culture of Fear, I shout out by name in the book. Yeah. He, he did a good job of this. He looked at a lot of the fears of the 90s in what became a bestseller, a uh, young child kidnapping, airplane crash, and he found out death during an operation. He found out that less than 200 people, at least in the first two cases each year, are targeted or badly harmed by either of those threats. So yes, as horrible as young child kidnapping is, if it turns out only 100 people every year are victims of it, that probably should not be the lead story on every television news program every day for a month. Same thing with police violence involving black men, and same thing with hate crimes, often, yes. Yeah, but... Uh, all right, a plane goes down somewhere and a couple hundred people get killed. Everybody sees it on the front page of the newspaper. It's on the front page of the newspaper. It's all that people are talking about at the cable news for a couple of days. And now people are afraid to get on an airplane. They overestimate the risk that flying poses to them because of the salience of a public report about yes. a plane going down. I'm not sure that this is any different from that. So, um, I mean, the... Uh, how the media, I mean, you almost said fake news. You didn't quite say it, but you almost said it. How, how the media are trying to start a race war because they uh, report with some sensationalism events that maybe they don't know for sure if it actually happened, but it would appear that it happened. I mean, who knew for sure that Jesse Smollett had made it up at the time that it report well, came in? Should they have not I did. talked about it? You didn't believe him from the start? No way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it ain't oh, case, oh, what I'm trying to get at is, okay, sensationalism. I grant you that. Um, okay, overestimation of a risk that people might uh, uh, perceive as being greater than it actually is. But is there something sort of uniquely uh, uh, pernicious or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, something un unusually uh, outside the realm of what we know human psychology is going to tell us about the kinds of perceptual biases uh, that uh, we are all uh, susceptible to in in the case of uh, race-motivated or, or gender-motivated, religion-motivated hate crimes? Well, I, I think there is something very dangerous as an academic speaking to another academic about the promotion of in-group, out-group violence, because I think we know where that can lead. Um, and you're right. I didn't empiric I didn't quite use the phrase fake news. I didn't say we are going to have a race war. I, you know, obviously you want a provocative title, but I don't think I exaggerated uh, to any significant degree there. I think that there is a narrative in the United States right now that I sometimes refer to as the continuing oppression narrative that is actually extremely dangerous for the country and extremely damaging to race relations. Okay, let's talk about that. So okay. I think that one of... So first of all, obviously, you're right. The media is generally sensationalistic. Right. If the media, except for long-form conversations like this one, perhaps, is an ad delivery vehicle. So the things that appear on Fox News or CNN are those things that sell Chevy Silverados and Viagra pills. There seems to be a set grouping of things that people are afraid of, excited by, and that will pay attention to. Um, the risks of sex and sexuality and also of parenthood, the atavistic terror of being eaten by an animal, things bursting into flames... Uh, racial conflict, blacks and whites fighting in the street with sticks. We all know the seven or eight things the media talks about all the time. So sensationalism is real. I also do think the media in the United States, along with most of the discursive sector, leans left. 
I'm not a radical partisan. I'm center to center right myself, but this is just a fact. Uh, we've all seen the Pew 2004 data. 93% of mass media journalists test as liberals or left-leaning moderates. So I think that in the context of those Pew results, one of the things you see very often in the media is this narrative of extreme ethnic conflict. So Black Lives Matter openly says, this is in the platform of the movement for black lives, that police kill between thousands and tens of thousands of essentially innocent black people every year. All right, we know that's false. Yeah, it's wildly, wildly. More like 250 or something like that. Yes. If, yeah, if they're innocent. Some are innocent. Some are, I mean, there are, there are a total of about 1,200 people killed by the police in a typical year. 250 will be black. The year I looked at, I'm not going to pretend this extends to every year. I don't know. But in 2015, the total number of unarmed, essentially innocent, black men killed by specifically white police officers was 17. And some of them were fighting the cops. So to say tens of thousands is a misread by 55 standard deviations, by orders of magnitude, not real. Okay, but let, let me try this on you because I've, I've been thinking this for some time since the rise of Black Lives Matter, which is, okay, a cop kills a, a unarmed kid or a cop kills a kid, kills somebody running away from them when the, maybe the cop didn't need to shoot. Let's say the cop happens to be white and the kid happens to be black. Now we've got a federal case. People are marching. Al Sharpton has flown in. Uh, and it's it's on TV. Um, now, you're from Chicago. I'm from Chicago. Not that long ago, maybe it was a couple of years ago, a Chicago police commander was murdered uh, by an African-American criminal. Uh, the commander was across the street from City Hall. He got a, he got a call that someone was uh, fleeing. He decided to try to answer. And he saw the guy go down the stairway. He follows the guy down the stairway. The guy gets a drop on him and shoots him dead. The guy's black. The cop is white. Nowhere did I uh, read, and I wouldn't have wanted to read, and I shouldn't have read, that black criminal murders white cop at the bottom of a stairwell. I didn't read that. The race of the people was not uh, injected into the reporting of that crime. And yet, if instead the cop had gotten his gun out in time and shot the criminal, the whole story would have been white cop shoots black criminal and people would have been marching on uh, North Michigan Avenue complaining about you know, about this thing. Now, here's my point. My point is, is it really in the interest of African-Americans to racialize crime, police interactions, and punishment in the country? When you, when you look at the statistics of how many of the offenders are African-American, are you sure you could control the use of race in the discussion of crime and punishment in America if you're a black advocate? such that it only gets used when it benefits you and you're going to point a finger and call a racist anybody who uses it uh, in the other direction? You can't control that. And even if you can prevent newspapers from running headlines that say black criminal kills white cop, you can't prevent people from thinking that around their, uh, around their uh, dinner tables when they're talking about the day's news. This could be actually a disaster for black people. The framing of the discussion of police criminal interactions in explicitly racial terms could turn out to be an absolute political disaster for black people. Do you agree with that? Uh, I agree with a large part of it. I will say first, in fact, um, coming from a region of the country here in Kentucky that produces a lot of the whites that go to prison in the USA, uh, I will say one of the things that might balance that out is that with the exception of certain crimes like robbery, there are also a very large number of white and Hispanic criminals. So I, I essentially I agree with you, but I, there are two points I'd make here. First of all, one part of the police shooting debate is simply the fact that the majority of the people, 78 percent majority of the people shot by law enforcement officers in the United States are Caucasian. Um, so there's no shortage of broke Hispanic, Italian American, Irish American, Russian individuals in Chicago. Um, that could also engage in a hostile encounter with the police. And those numbers are much higher in Kentucky or West Virginia. So I think the first thing that many people are aware of before they become aware of the fact that a disproportionate number of criminals as well as police shooting victims are um, African-American is the first level of kind of red pilling about this debate is simply the fact that the majority of the people shot by the cops happen to be white or Hispanic. And this is this is just ignored. Um I think in terms of the point you're actually raising, though, if people begin to look at demographic patterns by race, will that be a good thing for African-Americans? 
The answer very often is no. Um, I think given the fact that national desegregation occurred in 1954, I have the minority uh, but logically defensible viewpoint that blacks are actually doing fairly well in the USA. Um, I think that the civil rights vision of how to get ahead is probably no longer what African Americans need. I think a focus on fatherhood, SAT scores, so on, would do a great deal more for the black community than marching around with signs. But I don't think black people overall are doing badly. However, you're absolutely right that if you say, well, African Americans make up 13.2% of the population, but 23.5% of those shot by cops, a response from someone on the right could easily be, well, you also make up 48% of the murderers. Yeah. yeah, you don't necessarily want to racialize that. I think you're seeing this now with the alt-right, by the way. I have no sympathy for the alt-right, but the alt-right is essentially identity politics for broke white men. Uh, college students who feel buried by debt, working class kids in states like Kansas that we've forgotten about smart, young hacker boys on the internet. The alt-right is a bunch of white guys saying, why can't we say for white people the things that many African-American leaders on the hard left, like Al Sharpton, say for black people? So if you say 27% of those shot by the cops are black, we will say, well, 48% of the murderers are black. Yes, I do think that's a risk. I, in general, dislike racial identity politics in large conglomerate nations. I think in political science, we've seen over and over where that can lead with countries like Russia and Yugoslavia falling apart into a collection of states with names like the Republic of you and me. And I'm not sure about me. So I'd rather not see it in America. And yeah, you, you do have a point there. OK, now <laughs> the viewers will see that you are black. Uh, oh, I think Kentucky hopefully. State University is a historically black college. Am I wrong in saying that? Yeah, it's an 1866 land grant. It's one of the first uh, 18 or so HBCUs. Yeah, that is correct. Okay. Uh, uh, and you say you're a moderate conservative, moderately conservative? I, I, again, not to put words in your mouth, but that's what I thought I heard you say. Yeah, I'm a center to center, right? I have a business background. So I was one of the trading floor guys for uh, Marcus Evans in Chicago for a couple of years. Uh, I see. Run, run a small business before. So I come from kind of a, an empirical, what are the facts, money-focused standpoint. And that often leads, especially males, more to the right than it would to the left. So center right, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't quite know how to put this. How, how is it being a black conservative at a historically black college uh, in the year 2019? I mean, it, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, Honest answer, surprisingly pleasant. And this this gets into something that I, I am, have been surprised by since coming here, but the great historically black colleges, uh, KSU, Morehouse, Howard, Center State, our rival, are not very quote unquote woke. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if everyone's black, you don't need to pretend to be guilty all the time. Uh, the majority of our faculty members are fairly well qualified upper middle class black guys. We have one of the highest ratios of PhD to faculty in the country. So it's a fairly good school with a bunch of black guys. So many of these conversations, do 20% of the faculty vote Republican or something like that, they can just be had without constant virtue signaling. I will say that most African Americans in practice, if you look at church membership, tend to be personally moderately conservative. Uh, politically, they tend to go over to the Democratic side, but again, vote for fairly moderate candidates, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton. This is all pretty well known. Bernie is struggling with the black vote. So I guess where I'm going with this is that the blue-haired, bomb-throwing hard right with the exception of some BLM fighters, seems to be mostly a white thing. That's not incredibly prevalent at KSU. Huh. 20% of the faculty voting Republican? Is that a real number? That's uh, that's an estimate. I, I don't know. I didn't poll them. But, I mean, I would say that I've there are a fair number of conservative black people that I've met at Kentucky State, and I've gone to HBCU events. I mean, our president, M. Christopher Brown, who's a good, effective leader, and, again, a black guy in a suit, um, hosted a country concert. I think it was Travis Tritt for some of our larger donors who are both black and white because this is Kentucky. So I think that it was much more accepted. He asked, well, who would these black military veterans and these white ranchers want to see? And it was, uh, there's a couple options thrown around. One was a little boozy, but I mean, I think it was fairly apparent that most of the donor base would prefer some of the country boys. So, I mean, I think that that was done here without any significant amount of guilt, any, breast beating about would there be one confederate flag in the audience 
So obviously, again, like you, like everybody else, I oppose actual racism. But I think at a black college, there's a little less of the baseball is racist kind of nonsense that you see on the white left, much of which is just virtue signaling to show that you are a good white person to minority buddies. Um, we don't we don't do that here, as King Tachaka said. So, I mean, it's <laughs> just it's, it's fairly relaxed. I mean, if I were to go on Alex Jones, I would be ridiculed the next day in our lunchroom, quite possibly. But Glenn Lowry or Tucker Carlson? No, there's no way. Wait, no, wait, wait, Glenn Lowry or Tucker Carlson? I object, I object. I'm not putting you guys in the same. <laughs> I'm, I'm messing with you. I'm just kidding, man. Uh, but but uh, you're a political scientist. Now, if indeed, the uh, once you get away from the clique lights and uh, the virtue signaling white liberals and you get on an environment like at uh, Kentucky State University, uh, which is a predominantly black and you say people are a little bit less woke. How come they all vote Democratic nonetheless? How come they're voting 90% Democrat? How come you can't find a single prominent African-American, almost, almost, who's willing to uh, stand up and say Donald Trump is not the worst thing since sliced bread, and he might have a point or two, things like that? I think that that is a set. I mean, by now you're almost talking about cultural norms or heuristics. I mean, most black people are culturally fairly conservative. And I'm not saying this is a good or bad. It's just a fact. If you look at rates of church attendance, rates of military service, African-Americans are good Americans, 30.7% of active duty military troops. If you look at views of gay marriage, although I'm personally for gay marriage, I don't really have a horse in that race as a straight unmarried guy. Um, But if you look at all of that, the black community on average is one of the most patriotic, most conservative communities in the USA. The question, and I'm an internationalist, I'm not an Americanist political scientist, I I don't know all the details, the three waves of the quote-unquote Southern strategy and so on. My understanding is just by this point, many African Americans have been convinced for roughly three modern generations that the Republicans are the party of racism. African American allegiance to the Democratic Party is based totally on race and racialized voting. It's the idea that the Republicans are bigots. I don't think if you ran most major centrist GOP ideas from a strong military to charter schools to enterprise zones to traditional marriage past a bunch of black guys on a basketball court or a golf course, you'd have any real objection at all. It's the idea Trump is racist and before that Bush was racist, Mitt Romney's going to put y'all back in chains. It's a very consistent attack that's been leveled at every Republican candidate, which is that they're racist. Um, Sometimes for individuals like myself who are in that, I guess, free thinking demographic, proud to be black, but like I said, come from the business world. A lot of these claims seem ridiculous on their face. Like Mitt Romney, the milk toast hit of Bain Capital, one of the more integrated firms, at least in that arena, which does lean white, you know, binders full of women. I mean, is he really a Nazi? Is he really going to bring yeah, no. back slavery? No, but that's become the heuristic. Well, I'm still puzzled, and I'm not a political scientist. I take your point that your uh, your scholarly expertise may be more on the international uh, plane, but I'm still puzzled why there isn't more uh, dissension within African American politics. Why there aren't more challenges to sitting members of the legislature? Why why I don't see more uh, Candace Owenses and people of that ilk in the popular media? Uh, why I don't see anybody who's an African-American shows up on the Sunday interview shows like Meet the Press or Face the Nation or whatever uh, saying anything other than the party line. Why, when I pick up the Post or the New York Times or the Atlantic Monthly or whatever it is, the African-American commentators, whoever they might be, are pretty monolithically left of center in their orientation. I, 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 I'm, I'm puzzled by that uh, because uh, the actual results on the ground uh, in city upon city upon city around the country in terms of the effectiveness of governance and the extent to which uh, the, the day-to-day needs of African-American populations are being uh, met in, in advance, uh, the results are pretty meager. I mean, Joe Biden can stand up there and say, Mitt Romney going to put y'all back in chains, but uh, he can't really point, can he, to that much of uh, what uh, voting for the Democratic Party in a monolithic way has actually uh, produced in terms of reduction of poverty or uh, increase of wealth holdings or uh, uh, narrowing of test score gaps or et cetera, et cetera. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled why there's not more ferment, more 
uh, back and forth, more uh, dissatisfaction, more more debate amongst African Americans about. Oh, I mean, let me just. I, I don't want to uh, filibuster here. I just want to say one more thing. Black Lives Matter comes on the scene. They say uh, cops are shooting. They maybe exaggerate the problem or whatever. They have their shtick. They have their thing. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Three queer women created Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Now, now, you and I are from Chicago. You know what's going on there. And Chicago's only one of the places it's going on. It's going on in St. Louis, and it's going on in Baltimore, and it's going on in a lot of places, okay? Black Lives being snuffed out on a daily basis by violent criminals. Um, how can it be that there's no vigorous public pushback against the narrative that is put out by Black Lives Matter that the main issue confronting African-American security is rogue police officers. How can there be no African-American pushback against that narrative? I'm deeply puzzled by that. Or, or um, the, uh, the African-American church, which we know to be a pillar of the cultural and you know, spiritual and political history of our people in this country, uh, and yet, and, uh, the, the, uh, you remember when, uh, uh, the guy, uh, I'm trying, I'm, I'm blocking on his name now. This was the minister who delivered the eulogy at Aretha Franklin's funeral, uh, Williams. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of his first name. Oh, no. Do you know it? No, not off hand, no. Okay, but you know what I'm talking about? Well, anyway, uh, let me just finish the sentence. The guy stands up and he says, you know, all these babies born out of wedlock. We're the fathers. Uh, he stands up and he says, bodies left and right everywhere. I look, guys with guns killing each other. What's all about that? Uh, he says, you know, we need to get our stuff together in the African-American community. He uses the occasion of Aretha Franklin's funeral to make that speech. Um, and a ton of bricks fell on him. And I didn't see much defense of him either, so I'll stop. My, my question is, why is there not more vigorous debate if, as you say, the basic tenor of uh, social issue uh, orientation amongst African Americans is conservative because I don't see that reflected at all in either the political or the intellectual uh, uh, public leadership of the African American community. I think that there are three or four things there. First of all, I think in the Trump era, you have begun to see a bit of that. I'm not going to give Mr. Trump all the credit for this, but I mean, you've seen fairly large movements like Blexit. And a lot of that's because of almost the mocking questions asked by Trump. At one point, he just stood up on the stage and said, what the hell do you have to lose? And a couple of days after that, he started polling at 18 to 20 percent among black men, which isn't bad for a GOP candidate. So, I mean, that, I think, is a very insightful question for all of Trump's bluster and foolhardiness. I mean, it's what do you have to lose? If you're living in Maxine Waters congressional district, what do you think is going to get worse? So I think you have seen people start effectively asking that question uh, in the social media era. But two, there, there are other components. Point two, I think, is that people who do ask that question historically, what have we gotten from the left wing alliances the race is currently entangled in? have tended to be attacked by multi-ethnic sort of left-wing coalitions. Bill Cosby is the classic example. Uh, the minister that you mentioned, I know who you're talking about. I don't remember his name either, but I know exactly who you're talking about. I think it's Casper Williams. Oh, Jasper. Casper. Jasper. Okay. With a J. Jasper Williams is his name. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, I'm not surprised that happened to him. Um You've seen a couple of these Jesse Lee Patterson where the, the immediate yeah. response has been, let's drum this guy off of all media. Yeah. As I recall, someone, Michael Eric Dyson, maybe wrote a book about Bill Cosby yeah. uh, that was subtitled, has the black underclass screwed up or has Bill Cosby lost, lost his, his mind? mind? So, I mean, obviously that's a second component of this and something I considered before writing just sort of a mainstream center right book. I mean, a book that I hope to be a bestseller. We're not, there are no swastikas on the back cover. But the question is, are you going to be attacked? Are you going to spend hours dealing with BS? Okay, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are no swastikas on it, but Regnery, Regnery Press, I mean, come on. We know what that is. That's a right-wing press. They, they have an agenda, uh, and they've been having one for 40 years, as far as I can tell. No, the book itself, so there are a couple of things. The book itself, first of all, one component here, again, is about the Overton windows in society. 
So I didn't just explain to people what that is. Not everybody knows what an Overton window is. An Overton window is the area of acceptable conversation that you can have without being attacked. I think the right to a certain extent, but the left dramatically have been shrinking Overtons recently. So, I mean, for much of the hard left, anything east of the center left is Nazism. That's how you get Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro. I think both those guys are Jews, a conservative and an Orthodox Jew. But all these guys, uh, what's his name, Jordan Peterson, myself, you, Larry Elder, just a whole random collection of people, Democrats. There he goes again. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but just all these – no, I'm not, I'm not comparing all of you guys. But, no, just Joe Rogan. I can compare you and Joe Rogan. He's a cool guy. Um, but the point is that all of these people are labeled as Nazis by a component of the left. So we're talking about shrinking Overton's. Where I'm going with this is I didn't just pitch the book, Hate Crime Hoax, to Regnery. Um, I was a trading floor guy for years. I'm very aware of how to get contact for executives at almost any company. I pitched four or five book publishers. Uh, email sequences of that still exist. And a lot of them basically said, well, this is something we couldn't publish, even though we know it's probably true. Uh, a conservative press, which obviously does have an agenda, but was the one uh, entity that took a flyer on a book that I don't really think is all that conservative. They provocative up the title a little. But the longest chapter in the book deals with hoaxes by alt-right whites. There's nothing especially radical about this book. What's radical to many people is the idea that you're saying something outside this very narrow, politically correct window of acceptable discussion. But the point of this is when I mentioned everyone from Joe Rogan to Dave Rubin, many people don't want that kind of smoke in the black community either. I mean, a lot of black business people off the record will say, on any golf course, will say exactly what we're saying. They just don't want to go on CNN and say it and be called an Uncle Tom for a year. So I think that point one, there are these massive attacks against forbidden speech. And it's not just against blacks anymore, if it ever was. I mean, you're seeing these massive retaliations for relatively mundane things. I'm no fan of Roseanne Barr at all, but I mean, she took a picture of Valerie Jarrett and said she looked like the princess character from Planet of the Apes, and her show, which was number one on television, was canceled. Now, unacceptable joke, sure, an apology, sure, but people are losing hundreds of millions of dollars. Donald Sterling had to sell the Clippers because of this kind of thing, and I think a lot of people just say, no, I don't want to be involved in that. I don't want to be involved in the race debate, the class debate in America. It's become too ugly. So one, 18% of people now are moving that way. Two, no one needs that level of heat. But I think three, probably the most important, the average black person, middle to upper middle class, African-American, raised in a black family, goes to a black church, really believes the race narrative. This is one thing I often have to correct white friends on. They'll say, well, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, those guys are just race hustlers. And so are the people that follow them. No one could believe that. When I talk to my students, though, people do passionately believe this. The main reason for black affiliation with loyalty to the left of the or the center of the democratic party is this idea that racism is everywhere virtually any problem in the black community by a traditional black leftist academic will be blamed on racism this is simply a fact test score gaps racism uh single parent homes racism uh black people participating less in the sierra club racism so this whole idea of white privilege cultural appropriation black lives matter And now in the social media world, you've seen the publicization of almost literally every confrontation between a black and a white. You know, pool party, Paula, coupon, Carl, barbecue, Becky. So many people believe that as corrupt as many black elected officials are, they're the only bulwark against the Klan. Uh, I guarantee the New York Times has this year and for the past 10 years run the headline KKK rising again. So this idea has convinced a lot of people they need to go with the lesser of two evils to fight literal Nazis. Yeah, uh, I've got um, a um, amendment uh, to that uh, analysis that you just gave. Yes, people are believing the race narrative, the racism narrative, the white supremacy narrative, and um, I they they have less warrant to do so than they think. But I think one other thing that's going on is that people are aware of the failures within African American society and that they are ashamed of them. And that they are, uh, this is a kind of cognitive dissonance. This is like not seeing reality because it's just too painful to see. Uh, they're looking at out of wedlock birth rates in the 70% range. They're looking at uh, an order of magnitude higher homicide victimization and homicide offending rates. They're looking at standard deviation differences in measures of intellectual performance and math and reading and so forth 
uh, throughout the school range. They're, they're looking at uh, <laughs> the absence of uh, wealth accumulation within the community. Uh, they're looking at incarceration rates, if I didn't mention that, that are through the roof. Um, they're, they're looking at uh, exam schools in New York City composing classes of a 1,000 kids that has a dozen blacks in it uh, when they have to compete on the merits uh, on a test with other people. Um, and the year is 2019. We're half century past the 1960s. It's just unbearable. The failure, this is failure. This is simply people not performing. This is people not living up to their human potential. This is people not fulfilling their responsibilities. Okay? This is people who could do but are not doing better. And it's just unbearable to look it in the face. You, you desperately need a narrative. If the uh, race narrative weren't there, somebody would have to invent something. Of course, we're talking about slavery. Of course, we're talking about 1863 or 1910, because it's just too painful to talk about 2019. Of course, white supremacy has got us and is holding us back. What's the alternative account? If it's not white supremacy, it's us. And people can't bear to look that one in the eye. That's my theory. I think actually that's that's very insightful. But I'll, I'll add one thing. I think that the prevalence of the race narrative is the result of what I call ignoring the third option in my research. So I think a lot of black Americans think there are basically two explanations. Either racism is causal for these problems in the black community, or we are actually in some way genetically inferior. I don't think that's accurate. I think that Tom Sowell and other people, um, including people from around the world that have said, for example, Irish gypsy communities, yeah. have uh, proposed a third option, which is that there are cultural variables that dramatically affect things like crime rate and IQ. In the black community, the most significant of those is the absence of a father. So I think that if you really want to look at these issues, step one is honestly looking at the pathologies in the black community. But when you do, you notice a couple of things. First, a lot of these issues did not exist when racism and ethnic conflict were more severe. So in 1959, for example, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the illegitimacy rate, I think, was 12 percent for blacks, 4 percent for whites. I think it was higher, but not much higher. I thought it was 20 percent or so. But that's neither. Moynihan was reporting just five years after 1969, and his number was like a quarter. Is 21. But, but white, in, in any case, it was yeah. a lot lower than it is now, a lot lower. But point one, I mean, and let's, so yeah, somewhere between 12 and 20%, let's say, neither of us is fudging at all. I mean, okay. Uh, so yeah. Um, so one, many of these issues did not exist for blacks or whites or poor whites or whatever when ethnic conflict was much worse. Two, many of these issues do not exist for genetically identical brown immigrants today. Nigerians, West Indians, for that matter, Indian Dravins, if you want to flip the script a little bit, do better on average than whites. Point three. Many of these pathologies do exist for working class whites today. Um, the illegitimacy rate is over 30% for all whites. Uh, in Kentucky, it's 40 some percent. It must be over half for younger, lower income whites. So that's the pool of analysis. So yes, these pathologies exist in the black community. Um, the general response is it's got to be racism. Otherwise, it's got to be genetic. There's got to be something terrible, weakness of the blood there. That's not real. Um, cultural factor variables play a huge role in situations like this, as evidenced by points one, two, and three I just made. So I think we need to look honestly at these pathologies. I think we need to look at points one, two, and three. And then I think we need to see what's actually happened with some of these metrics. So, for example, if you look at black IQ or black income, one of the things you see is that there's a profoundly positive story there. Uh, Dick, did you read Dickens and Flynn, the 2006 paper? No. You should check it out. They basically look at the results. All of these sort of culture fair, NSDAP, these broad longitudinal IQ tests have been implemented in the 70s because there was such a reluctance to look at race and IQ. The results of them hadn't really been studied much. These two um, scholars, Dickens and Flynn, I forget their first name. Flynn is of the Flynn effect. This is the same guy, right? The, uh, the Flynn the, effect, absolutely the, correct. The, yeah, what they find the, is simply the black IQ has risen to about 93. It's nothing crazy. We still have progress to make. But the the genetic argument, there's an all, almost alt light. It's blogger. James Flynn. Excuse me for interrupting. His name is James Flynn, and he is the author of the so-called Flynn effect, which yes. is the observation uh, in other settings that there tends to be a secular trend of rising IQ yes, that's over the decades. And the same has been uh, documented for African Americans. Is that what you're reporting? Yes, but actually African Americans, again, the paper Dickens and Flynn 2006, what they find is that African Americans have closed, in addition to everyone's IQs rising, 
African Americans have closed five to seven points of what was initially a 13 point IQ gap with whites. So when you actually look at the results of the scores on these tests that were implemented and then never studied, black people seem to have moved to within, say, 92 versus a white score of 99 as versus 84. There's no genetic way that could have happened in 30 years. Uh, Tom Sowell has made this point over and over again, by the way, that IQ, large group IQs, when people abandon what he calls a peasant culture or a slum culture, frequently jump 20, 30 points. So I'm black and Irish. I mean, at the time of World War One, the average IQ for Irishmen was about 80. It's currently 102. That's hard to believe. I, well, I mean, first of all, I question the measurement. I mean, how are we measuring IQ at the turn of the, tw- the 19th? Uh, uh, Army alphabet. This, is, this is race and Come culture. On, 80? That's, a, that's more than a standard deviation below the... No, this is, this is absolutely real. This is race and culture. Let me see the book. It's on my bookshelf. Is it Tom So? Yeah, let me get... The- Sorry, yeah, this is Race and Culture, page 162. Um, yeah, but we're going to have to look at the footnote because uh, I want to know what the source of the measurement is because uh, it's such an extraordinary number. No, this is the, I'll look at the footnoting here, but okay. This is, sorry, it's page 160. So he's looking at Army Alpha Basic in World War I and okay. then again World War II as a comparison sample. So the proportions of soldiers with different ancestries who exceeded the American national IQ norms were as follows. English, 67%. German, 49%. Irish, 26%. Russian, 19%. Italian, 14%. And as many Chicagoans may have heard some jokes based around this, Polish, 12%. So he then goes into Americans of Italian, Slovak, Irish, Greek, Portuguese, Polish, Croatian, Spanish, and Lithuanian ancestry, all averaged in the 80s. So the footnote here, footnote 13, is apparently to the alpha basic tests given to most American men over these two wars. So I think when, there's a massive amount okay. of this cultural evidence that's rarely discussed. Okay, so uh, bracket my concerns, and I will, I will definitely refer to the Bible. I meant to say Thomas Sowell's book uh, mm-hmm. momentarily. But, um, and, and, and let's just get the point on the record that IQs in populations uh, show a considerable amount of drift over time. Uh, suggesting that the genetic determination of group differences is probably uh, shouldn't be taken as seriously as some people want to take it. It's only one piece of evidence to that effect. There are all the heritability studies and so forth. But I, but I'm I'm on your side in that and and Tom Sowell's side um, in that debate. Uh, I want to make one point about culture, which I do think is important, but which I also think is not given in uh, uh, nature. It doesn't descend from heaven. It too is a product of social processes. Yeah, yeah, historical processes. So a person could still say, even if there are some impediments to African American progress that are rooted in cultural practice, that those nevertheless derive from the historical oppression of African Americans. We're not yet out of the race narrative, even when we start talking about culture, is what I'm saying. I, mean, I think you have to go one step further and say, even if the history of slavery and Jim Crow is implicated in the cultural pathologies that beset African American communities, that's that's not very helpful in figuring out what to do going from here, <laughs> you know. Uh, so yeah. there's enough finger pointing to go around. We can blame American racism, uh, in part at least, for difficulties that African American communities face on the cultural front. That's a historical argument that uh, for which I think some evidence could be adduced, but it's not very helpful in figuring out what to do next. I also think another point, I think there's a difference between historical and contemporary racism. And this is where I get into some of my research and some of modern quantitative work in general. So obviously any standard regression analysis, whether you're talking about linear, logit, whatnot, can control for the effect of one variable, one independent variable on a DB, a dependent variable with the other independent variables held constant. So you can see how someone would be treated if you can see how two individuals would be treated if the only thing that varies between them is race, say a white and a black, with class, age, IQ, region of the country, so on, all neutralized. And what we find is that if you're comparing identical people today, there is almost no effect of race or of racism. Um, what there is seems to be countered by what are actually fairly large-scale effective affirmative action programs although I have real ethical problems with them. So when you talk about racism, for example, I did a study of what I called white privilege. Uh, just pretty basic, a few hundred people so far. I haven't fully IRB'd it and done thousands of people. 
But I constructed a 100, pay, a 100 question list that included everything from have you ever been able to work an unpaid internship to have you ever been beaten in a violent fight to do you know what frequent flyer miles are? I had a couple people bet through it. It was a metric for privilege, having an easy life. And I gave this to a mix of people, uh, Kentucky Appalachian kids, black kids, rich white kids, and then adjusted. I put it in Stata, ran a standard OLS model. What I found is that with everything else equal, being white gives you about a two-point advantage in America. So, i.e., a working class white guy from the South would be treated a little bit better than a working class black guy from the South. I don't think that shocks anybody. But all of these other variables, like class, region of the country, the South had a huge disadvantage versus the North, sex, women were disadvantaged versus men, attractiveness, IQ. The it was more could, important than race. Far more important. So in today's society, I think there's almost nothing – this is a very important, actually. Not, I, I don't think I'm some groundbreaking genius, but – this is quite critical. There's almost nothing holding you back as a black or Asian individual, assuming you're a citizen. I had a lot of variables. But versus a white individual. The issue seems to be that there are fewer, say, upper class black individuals due to historical racism. But this distinction matters because you're absolutely right that that's due to past bigotry. But fighting racism almost can't fix it. We're already at a point where you're treated pretty much the same as a black, white or Asian adult citizen. So I think that the quote-unquote salvation of the black community will be moving away from the race narrative. The, the only question there is whether something like continued affirmative action or even reparations would be useful to fix the percentage harms caused by the past. But focusing more on race and racism today will do nothing because we're already roughly equalized. I believe my conclusions there. I, the richest groups in the country are Nigerians, Japanese, Indian Americans who come here without our legacy of fighting one another and become wealthy. All right. Uh, let me ask you something about hate crimes. I'm going to shift the, uh, shift the gear here a little bit. All right. uh, because I, I've been having a heretical thought of late with all this talk about hate crimes. I'm not talking about hoaxes now. I'm not right. talking about hoaxes. I'm just talking about hate crimes. And the thought is, okay, um, hate is not illegal. Mm -hmm. I, you, you can't punish people for what they think, right? I mean, they have a freedom of conscience. They don't have to like Jews. They don't have to like black people. Now, if they shout fire in a crowded theater by going up uh, and uh, using the N-word or something, uh, I can see that I might want to associate law enforcement on that person with the uh, hatred uh, because the uh, because it's an act of incitement that could produce violence or something like that. But if 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 somebody robs somebody on the street, why am I parsing what their uh, uh, attitude toward the uh, victim of the robbery was? The point is that the person was robbed. Uh, if a, if a man rapes a woman, I'm not interested in whether or not he's quote a misogynist close quote. If a gunman shoots up uh, a uh, a gathering of innocent people. Why am I interested in whether or not he's, quote, a racist, close quote? He's a murderer. I'm going to react to the fact that he's a murderer. Why am I in the business of trying to uncover what's in the mind of the person who's committed the crime and then uh, regard the crime as somehow dramatically different in virtue of my guess about what's in the mind of the person? Uh, so I guess I'm making two points here. What is it about why am I punishing a person for what they think? I should punish them for what they do. And the second one is, how do I know what they think? I'm in the business now of guessing about what they think when I know what they've done, and that's, the, that's what I should be reacting to. So how well, do you react the, to that? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit dubious about this whole, this whole uh, aspect of the law. Um, well, the second point, I think, is fairly easy to answer. I mean, in general, for a hate crime to be successfully prosecuted, you do need uh, in-practice evidence of bias, is a term you often see. So if someone yells, you know, I hate you, let's say, chosen people, and then hits a Jewish American with a car. It's not very hard to prosecute that as a hate crime. I think the first point is the more serious point. It's one I thought about and struggled with a bit reading the book. The idea of bias crimes is essentially that attacking anyone is bad, but attacking people because of their race, ethnicity, sexuality is worse. It indicates depraved bigotry. I tend to agree with you that I'm not very sure about that. 
Um, so, for example, the hate crime statutes generally do cover certain things like race and sexual orientation. They don't cover certain other things like, for example, political party, um, social class. If you beat someone brutally because they were, quote unquote, a homeless bum, or if you kicked someone almost to death because they were a Trump supporter or they were wearing a Che Guevara shirt, and all three of those are cases we've seen, that's not a hate crime. Whereas if you punch someone because they're gay and say, could you take that somewhere else? That is a hate crime. Uh, so I'm not sure about the utility of hate crime laws in the first place. Um, my own impression would be coming from a legal background prior to a business background that hate crime laws to some extent were a way to round up what uh, were called great white defendants of the bonfire of the vanities. So there tends, <laughs> there tends to be that's a bit Tom of, Wolf's novel from the 1980s that makes me smile every time I think about it. <laughs> it's, a, it's an entertaining book, but that tends to be a real issue in the legal system where people that have trained for the Pross side for three years at Michigan or Brown, University of Illinois, Yale, they, are, they find themselves putting away mostly unprepared, either African-American or extremely poor white individuals with nickel bags of marijuana. There's a desire to do something noble. There's a desire to crusade against these big causes like racism. So following a couple of major incidents several decades back, Matthew Shepard, James Byrd, you started seeing this national clamor from many agencies, including the most of the bar associations, all the prosecutors' bar associations, for this hate crime category. And the reality is, other than helping some people feel woke, I'm not sure what practical effect it's had. So in a typical year, there are about 7,000 hate crimes, counting all the fakes. Um, whereas in a typical year, there are about 12 million crimes. And so you do have to ask, does this distract from real issues like black-on-black -black gun violence or the opiate epidemic among working-class whites? Aren't we just getting a lot of camera time out of what are really pretty irrelevant cases? Uh, there's definitely a case to be made there. Uh, I don't have a strong position. If I were asked, I'd probably come down against hate crime laws. If you're talking about a serious hate crime, not spray painting something, but murder, the punishment for murder is often death. So it's hard to see you how you can amplify a sentence past death. Okay, um, I think we're kind of at the end of our hour. Um, what do you think when you hear people refer to the president of the United States, Donald uh, Trump, as a racist? I think that they're going for the low-hanging fruit. So first of all, I, this is an interesting question. So there, there are almost components to this. Is Donald Trump racially perfect? One. Two, is Donald Trump an actual genetic racist? Three, why are people making this claim and why did no one make it earlier? So point one, Donald Trump is not the most tactful man ever to exist. Uh, Donald Trump has said a whole range of things from describing a bunch of countries bluntly as shitholes. They were diverse, by the way. I mean, I believe Moldova was on that list, Bhutan. If you look at the TPS countries, they are black, white, and Asian. That was falsely represented as Trump hates black. But rarely does someone call an allied nation that we literally have a treaty of refugeeage with a an outhouse country, let's say. So Trump said a lot of stuff that normal politicians don't say. He's discussed his porn star girlfriends. He described a female activist journalist as bleeding from her whatever. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, I do. I have a soft place in my heart for gentlemanliness, so I'm not a big fan of this kind of thing. Yeah. Is Trump a genetic racist? Absolutely no evidence of that ever. Uh, Donald Trump, I'm a hip-hop guy, and Donald Trump literally hosted a G-Unit mixtape that I have. It's a hilarious encounter. Donald Trump, 50 Cent, and Lloyd Banks. And if you're familiar with hip-hop, these are actually two rappers that know how to manage their money. Yeah. They sit around, they talk about money. It's like the old Chappelle show skit. You got to diversify your bonds, homie. But I mean, it's just, oh, come on. I mean, Donald Trump is the New Yorker that appeared on Sex in the City with dates of yeah, every color. He's going to lunch with 50 Cent. Nelly shouted him out. Is there any evidence prior to running for president that Donald Trump was a genetic racist? Yes, the way he reacted to the Central Park Five. Well, that's that's a claim that's made. I would no, I don't think that qualifies. Did this he is, take out an ad calling for the death penalty on those guys who were yes, after, exonerated? After they confessed. So the Central Park Five thing is an interesting case in terms of racial tensions in New York, where a woman was brutally attacked. My uh, my girlfriend, my partner, actually has the book, I Am the Central Park Jogger. I mean, she was attacked, beaten nearly to death. Yeah. This is when kids, and in New York at that time, it would have been majority minority, but probably people of all races, 80s. But where kids would wild in the park, you couldn't run through the park yeah. because of all the 
taggers and people they brawling. called it wilding when these kids would go on their rampages. Yeah, they beat and rape people. Yeah, but I mean, it was so, happening. Yeah, yeah, of course. It was, yeah, I mean, there are movies about it. Like, but the these war guys movie. didn't do this thing. Yes, she was attacked by a group of kids wilding. They caught a group of kids wilding in the park in the morning, and the kids confessed probably after some pretty brutal threat. But everyone in New York wanted them crucified at the time. I mean, the expectation okay. of this, you never want to say, look how she was dressed or something like that at all. But the question was, what were you doing in the park at 1 a.m. with weapons? Like, how innocent could you be? So, no, I don't, I don't think that that is evidence of racism. If you want to talk about evidence of racism, Trump was once sued for bigoted lending in 73, I think. Yeah, his father, he was just coming into the business at the time. Uh, and they yeah. settled, they settled with the federal government because they were apparently screening the tenants to try to avoid uh, African Americans and their rental property. Yes, but it was, it was a settlement. There were 26 landlords involved. It was a settlement rather than a conviction. And Trump had been in the business, I think, for eight months, right. something like that. So no, I think that there's very little evidence that the guy from the G unit tapes is a racist. I think he's brash. He says a bunch of stuff that he probably shouldn't. Uh, I, by the way, I'm sure everyone has some residual racial prejudice. Okay, Charlottesville. Uh, I have my own view about this, but I want to hear yours. The president says there are good, uh, good people on both sides of the, et cetera. That's one of the things that Joe Biden, when he announced for president, made a point of reiterating that he was going to lead America in a different direction than the guy who found good, good people on both sides of a battle with uh, white supremacists. I think that that gets into my point three about low hanging fruit in media misrepresentation. So first of all, the actual comment, there were good people on both sides. I disagree with. I'm not sure there are many good people on either side. Um, what you had was a riot between a bunch of idiots. I mean, you had there. Were, one of my students actually asked the class, "If you have a riot between Nazis, communists, and crooked cops, who do you want to survive?" And the punchline was nobody. Um, and I mean, that's that's a harsh joke, but that's how I think many people felt about the Charlottesville situation. So in Charlottesville, you had the Unite the Right rally. I do not think those were good people. Those were people from the 4chan kind of belly of the internet mixed with actual white supremacists that showed up looking for a fight. But the people that met them, as someone who was active with Occupy years ago as a younger broker man, were also not a representative spectrum of great people. I mean, you had, just looking at the flags, you had Antifa, Black Bloc, which is a little different, CYA, Communist Youth Action. You had a bunch of fighters from the left that were coming to fight the fighters from the right. Um... I think that the gist of what Trump said, which is, but most of them, all of them, probably can, referring to both sides, very bad. That's probably how most people feel about a brawl between Klansmen and Antifa fighters. Uh, so that's more my perspective. I don't think you know, Trump should have said. I actually he, thought, and I, I was watching that news conference. I actually thought he was referring to the battle about the Robert E. Lee statue in that park there in Charlottesville. And that he was saying there are good people who wanted to take the statue down and there were good people who didn't want to take it down. That's what I well, thought he was saying. I'm, I'm actually using the harshest steel man analysis of what he said. So if he's just saying there are good people, bad people on both sides of the statue debate, yeah, sure. If he's saying that there were good people in the white street brawler crowd, I don't think so. I mean, maybe one yeah, or I two. Got- yeah, but I, I don't even know if I'd say that. Anyone that went to the Unite the Right rally is probably a racist. So but this, on the other hand, I don't have any – a lot of these domestic terrorist groups that are being eulogized by the left, I think that the right is better when it comes to dealing with white supremacy than the left is when it comes to dealing with this kind of basically communist violence. So everyone condemns neo-Nazis. Everyone who votes Republican even occasionally condemned Steve King. I did myself when he – said some stuff, we can't rebuild our society with other people's children. You can actually argue about the meaning of that, but nobody did. But I think when people on the left say the craziest stuff, the actual street fighters for Occupy, BLM, uh, Animal Liberation Front, Earth Liberation Front, which are all these events, those are actual domestic terrorist groups. Antifa, there's this rush to defend these guys. Like Antifa, people will say who know nothing about youth street culture, just means anti-fascist. I mean, that's that's like saying the gangster disciples are just a Christian group. Like that, that's meaningless nonsense. So no, my, my take on that would be, um, you know, not too many good people on either side, but Trump's comments, especially in their broadest sense, were not wildly offensive. I think that what you often get in these situations is one line taken out of context. So, I mean, in the Philando Castile shooting, the line that became internationally famous was he had a wide set nose. But that was a police officer describing the suspect in a robbery that he thought was Castile. And the police officer, Geronimo Yanez, I believe, was an American Indian. 
So you very often can manipulate a narrative by taking one sentence out of context and misquoting it. Trump overall, uh, I think he did have some alt-right dog whistles early on, like the Steve Bannon hiring. I do not think that Donald Trump, I mean, whose grandchildren, I presume, would be Jewish, if you think about it logically. Correct. Uh, ben Carson's in the administration. Ajit Pai's in the administration. No, I don't. I don't think there's any proof that he's a racist. One thing I will say: Trump should be a little more sensitive. But this same attack has been launched against like the last eight GOP candidates. The same attack. Mitt Romney is going to literally bring back slavery. Remember George W. Bush? He didn't care about black people. Yeah. I mean, you literally had Kanye West and Michael Myers standing in front of a picture of a bunch of dying African Americans saying Bush doesn't care about black people. Like this same attack with the same level of vigor uh, during the Katrina rescue effort in that case has been brought against almost every conservative candidate by the left. And I think that's one of the things that produced Trump. I mean, people kind of decided, well, hell, if Mitt Romney is going to be called a racist street fighter, you know, why don't we get someone aggressive, someone that's going to throw some punches? All right. Uh, This is Wilfred Riley, whom I'm speaking with, R-E-I-L-L-Y. He's at Kentucky State University, where he's associate professor of political science. He's got a new book out from Regnery Press on uh, hate crime hoaxes. Uh, And he's uh, been our guest here at the Glenn Show. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it, Will. Well, thank you, Glenn. Thank you for having me on. I enjoyed it.